Hey everybody, welcome back. Well, we have a lot to go over from ASML's earnings this evening to the bounce in the ES, and we're gonna start with the S&P 500. I'm gonna leave these levels in because we're gonna to get to them. But I think it's important just to note a couple things, and I just wanna drill into this very quickly. You were unable to get anywhere anywhere of consequence today, meaning nowhere near the ability to rally over that 55 SMA. You now have a very steep slope of a 12 and a 22 coming down. We talked about that we were probably going to rally today, um, and we talked about why, and we're, we'll get to that. But let's talk about the NQ and the fact that we really went nowhere. And I think that's very important when you look at the NQ and you realize that, okay, we really didn't do much today. And again, I'm going to leave these on because we're going to get to them. But I just want to zoom in on this for a second so people can see this before we start getting into the data. Because we have to talk about what's going on with the socks, smart money, dumb money. You see how the socks didn't break. We have to talk about why that probably happened, why I think it happened, why you saw the move in SMCI today, which was an absolute monster move, uh, and what this kind of means going forward. So there's there's a couple things here I really want to go over, and I want to show you some of the things that we're utilizing that are making this pretty successful trading. So we're going to jump right into it. So let's just start with the ES, and then what we're going to do is just jump in here to the five minute, and let's just go back all the way down and just look at these levels and how they're holding. So this is pretty easy technically trading, but it's technically trading for those that understand that you're consolidating or going into a downward trend. And what do I mean by that? We talked about this yesterday, lower highs, right, over and over and over again. And then you're getting to these levels and that you're not breaking. Now, you'll remember some of these levels from here. Watch this. Let's go back, way back, so that you can see them. So you can see these levels if you follow them straight across where they were pretty significant before. And what you're doing is you're testing those supports and then you're just not holding them. And I think that's a very important distinction that people aren't getting, that you're going to levels in March and you're cracking them right? See, stairs up, elevator down. You say it, right? Okay, that's the way it always is. You always take the stairs up, you always take the elevator down. In some cases, you're taking the window. So when we start looking at these levels, just understand what's happening. If we click off of everything for a moment, get rid of the ES, everything, and just look at nothing but price, it doesn't really take a rocket scientist to see what's going on here, right? I mean, I don't really need much. You really don't need to be trading that long to just understand that what's going up is starting to slope down. As a matter of fact, some people could actually say that they see what? What you see here, you'd actually see an upside down cup, right? I'm not going to get into too, too many patterns here, but of course you see this. Okay? Anyone would see this. And again, this is the S&P. I just took everything off so that we can just look at this for a second and just see how clean this is, right? A test, a test over and over again until it breaks the retest to the upside and it can't. And now you have this, quote, cup pattern. All right. So how long will this go on for remains to be seen. It's obviously being driven by economic factors such as what's going on with Powell's speech today, which was anything but good for the market. But if we take a look at the ES, and what I like to do with this is I just like to take a step back and look at things like the Ichimoku cloud when this is going on in a four hour. I don't really use it much past there, but when I start to see things like this, I have to pay attention. So when you start crossing here on a four hour, you're starting to set up. And I don't like when this happens. I mean, unless you're bearish, which I don't really like being bearish. It doesn't really suit me, right? Like I, I can trade it, I can do it, but I just don't like being bearish because it means the economy is going to get worse and things are going to be harder for people. That's usually what it means. So if we take a look at what's happening now, well, we're going to start to see some kind of change, right? Eventually these will cross and things will get kind of nasty for us. But this is day two of actually being in the cloud. And we have not been in that cloud for some period of time. If we take a look at NQ, this is day one technically of being in the cloud. And that means something to me. It might not to you, but I, you know, one of my best videos ever was the Ichimoku cloud. I used to do educational videos and I do more content about what's going on in the market now. But even if you start looking here and you can start seeing today's in the cloud again, it's not where you want to be. And why is that? At best, it means you're going to consolidate. And if you can't hop out of the cloud, then within a month, you're going to be on the other side of it and underneath of it. And if you're underneath of it, it's just complete underperformance. So this is what we have going on now. Now let's talk about what's happening and why I feel that we bounced. I can just point to a couple things that I think are pretty relevant. Number one, you have expectations. Number two, uh, one of the key data points we talked about yesterday, and this is go back to a bear chart, B-A-R-E, meaning not bear, but, and I'll just change that to plain, I guess. I see people seem confused by it. Uh, but if you see how this is going in here, 
we talked about this, like this historically was one of the lowest levels you've ever had. And so when this gets to that level, it's just kind of crazy, right? So now you're starting to do a little bit better. You're, you only have 8% of stocks now above their, what, uh, their five-day moving average, but you were at a 2%. It was an extreme level. So you were due for some kind of bounce. Now, how long we're going to bounce remains to be seen, because if you remember, we went through stocks above the 50-day as well, and you can see that dropping. Now, I do want to spend a little time on smart money, dumb money tonight so that you can see how fast this is changing because it's changing rapidly. But this is S5FI, and this is stocks at the 50-day. And you know, yesterday it was, oh, well, you were at 35, and now you're at 29. Okay, So that means you had 10% more stocks cut through their 50-day today. All right. And that's what you have to think about. What, you're, what people are going to look at is they're going to look at this and go, oh, well, on the five day, this is where we're at. So that means we're going to bounce. You might bounce short term. You might. But you technically, you have a lot of damage going on. That damage needs to be fixed. And there's only one leg of the stool left that's really going to fix that. And that's fundamental analysis right now. Technicals are broken. Macro's broken. That was our driver. It's no longer going to be our driver. So that becomes a problem. So now we're down to one leg, which is the fundamental leg. And a lot of that is going to be on ASML tonight, which will release earnings at one o'clock in the morning. But I want to just follow up on this because of yesterday. So when we look stocks above the 20 day, well, this is where we would put in a short term bottom, right? These are those levels where we could see some kind of short term bottom happening. And we can go through some other indicators like McClellan oscillators and look at those. And they're telling us very similar things like, yep, yeah, we could we could have some kind of short term bottom in here. But you know, for this to be a true bottom that is sustainable, any of these 20 readings from this S5TW, that they coincide with being down here and roughly a nine on the 50-day, and you're nowhere near there. And they'd also correlate with what happens on the 200-day where you'd be way off of here because stocks above the 200-day moving average are at 65. So we're nowhere near any kind of like really major, like, really gross level of just oversold. We're at a level of oversold that's an issue for sure, and that can lead to a bounce higher. Um, you know, I don't want to, to go through too many different oscillators today, but I do think it's important to get this. We could spend a lot of time going through different ones. Like we could sit here and look at the cues, for example, and go, uh, and we just use standard rate of change, or I could even use this, which I call uh, the four horsemen, which just pops it up real quick. And, you know, these are just very simple uh, oscillators and indicators that I use, and I, I kind of tweak them a little bit to work, you know, be better for the way that I see the world. But I'll give you an example. So, like, if I take a look at these and go, okay, well, here's MACD. Well, did MACD get better or worse today? It got worse. Okay, we're below the zero line for the first time, which means that this one usually follows suit. And if you kind of mark off those levels from there, that usually it doesn't make everybody feel warm and fuzzy about their, you know, tech positions. Now that can change, but again, if you start looking at some of these, you can see that it's not going to, it's not boding well. That's rate of change. And if you look at look at RSI and how that's rolling and how the, this moving average and these settings are different. So if you're looking at this, my settings are a little bit different and stochastics as well. As this is trading up, you can see stochastics is getting worse and worse. That doesn't mean that you're not going to bounce, but once you understand the environment that you're in, you can trade that environment. So one of the things that we did a really good job of today was understanding the environment, right? Because there's always opportunity. It's just understanding where you are. You don't want to tell yourself that you're somewhere that you're not. It's just pointless, right? So for us, the biggest thing was understanding that this level was here. Everybody kind of saw this level. I think this 40, this uh, fourth, what is it, 43260. I mean, it was pretty obvious level coming straight through. I mean, you, you struggled here over and over again. You traded up, you pulled back, you hit it, right? And then you couldn't get through and then you hit it again and then you just came right back down and tested. So whether you're playing the, the short side or the long side, it didn't really, it was kind of irrelevant. But what's pertinent about these levels is when you understand that you're in a trading range and you could say, well, we're not in a trading range, we're rolling over. That's fine too. But if you realize that you're grossly oversold, like we are, we went through some metrics there that showed that, then what you can do is you can take advantage of this. So when you have these pullbacks, you know how they're going to play this. Right. So I'll give you an example of this and I'll show you how we even use this line. I'll show you real time in a moment. But what we knew was we knew that this was the low. So what what are they going to do? They're going to undercut that low and they're going to stop hunt. Right. They being the institutions, high frequency traders. And I can show you what I think that they've been doing. I'll show you in a moment. But uh, what I think they're doing 
and, and you can actually use this to your advantage too. But if you see this, right? Okay, so there's the low, we undercut the low. All right, we're down here for a whopping two minutes. This is why I always tell people to wait for five minute closes so you can get a better understanding of what's going on and then see if you have a follow through bar, even though it costs more. So they shake, right? The old shake and bake. And then they just start going through the levels, back, retest. And then of course we have PAL speaking. But something as simplistic of th as this, if you know to look at the high beta names like the NVIDIAs of the world or the ASMLs that are coming out, ASML obviously has earnings tonight, uh, but if you know something like NVIDIA is going to be moved greatly, semis are gonna be moved greatly, you could take advantage of these opportunities. Here, watch this. So you wanna watch this really closely. This is pretty critical here. So what they're doing is they've undercut the low of yesterday and we know where we are like oversold. Now the NASDAQ's bouncing, so that's a good sign. So they're buying tech. So they undercut and then they're pulling it back up. So we're gonna to wanna to watch again. Now to me, this looks like an undercut and then they're gonna push it, which is what I thought might happen today because you are grossly overdone. There we go, good. We have something we can work off of yet. I need like a bar that's actually gonna close. So that's really what you're looking for. You're gonna get a bar that actually closes over this. We're setting up the bounce. So that's good for NVIDIA. And you set up and you have a bar you can work off of. 865 would be where you would use now and you make that higher high. So if you're looking to add, that's it. That's where you would be adding. You'd be adding here. You're making the higher high. You have the highest close that you've had, and you're using that low as your stop. If it goes, it goes. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But that's the trade. So that's where I would add to it. I'll add to it. It's only $5. I have a hard time believing that people are going to want to stay short in NVIDIA going into ASML earnings. That goes the cues. Okay, so we timed this perfectly. So we knew we were oversold. We watched the undercut right here, and then we watched it flush everybody out. We didn't panic. And now we just watched this little level break, watched the little flag, and now we're pushing. So in the video, I'm up like six bucks on that trade. If you want to sell some of that now that you're up six dollars, go for it. There's nothing wrong with that. Literally nothing wrong with that. Take some off the table and then just leave the rest right here. You could literally sell half that position that we just bought use low a day as a stop and have a free trade for the rest of the day. So again, if you wanted to trim and take the day trade, we're up five or six bucks and now it's up to you what you do with it. But I'm gonna hold it. Now we're up eight or nine, 10. Do what you want with it now. We're good, good. Up 10 there. All right, should have had a great morning. So that's us understanding the game that they're gonna undercut you right here. It's basically just, you know, modern day thievery. And then they're gonna go from there and they're gonna do their thing. And then we can actually use that to our advantage, right? We use their strength. Okay, and, and we just kind of swing with it. Remember, they're the sharks, we're the remora. And we can do the same thing over and over again. For example, like we did another trade uh, right in here when uh, Pal said some words. I mean, he might as well just have said the word boo for the way the market acted. But knowing where these levels were and how you responded here last time provided excellent opportunity for us. And I'll show you what I mean by that. When you know these key events, you have to understand you're fighting for inches, right? I've gone through this with that video before on reflexivity. You're fighting for inches. You're always fighting for more knowledge. So when you know Powell's going to speak and you know that he's going to say some word that's going to scare everybody and you drop down, like you did on the video, if you have your levels marked properly, it provides an opportunity, right? So you can see right in here. And so we know that Powell's going to speak. We know what to watch out for. We know that we want to watch TNX. Uh, we, I was short JP Morgan today, so I was just watching it. That trade's turning into an absolute monster short. Uh, it really is. Like the financials look like look disgusting, uh, for lack of a better term. That's that's the technical term right now. Disgusting. Uh, but I had three names I was really interested in today. Candidly, I mean, I was only going to show the one, but Nvidia, ASML, and CPNG. Um, and then I was just cracking a joke how easy this was to just watch everybody just get like shaken out and provide an opportunity for us to get in. Uh, and then all I did was just let it trade up. And my point was that if it cracked here and you're worried, just get out of the way. Uh, and that was very simple to do, you know, just to trim it or just get, get out of the whole trade. You're in down here and then you just, you're getting out of the trade. And then there's just the super technical term we call when something like this happens, <laughs> I say, boom. Uh, and then what you're doing is you understand where you are, right? And so all you're doing is you're marking off those resistances and you're scaling out into them. You're not cheering. You're not high-fiving your bros. Uh, you're getting out in here, right? All right. So if you understand and you mark these off consistently, that's how you can do this. But they're going to play these kinds of games a lot more. They even did it today uh, with NVIDIA, right? They did this pretty successfully with NVIDIA a couple times where they're like, oh, this time we're going to break out. You better get involved. Oh, yeah. Did you buy? Yep. Low a day. And then you're putting your stop here. And basically what you're doing is you're just making you know, market makers richer because you don't understand what they're doing, right? And this is pretty obvious, but it's when when does something like this happen is a little more, as I like to say, absolutely glaring when smart money, dumb money is fighting. And that's because institutions know 
uh, when they can take advantage of retail. I'll, I'll give you an example of this. I've been studying this for some time, but it seems a little more obvious right now. So in front of us is smart money, dumb money. And for those that are new, we don't call this smart money. We don't call this dumb money. We call this institutional money and we call this retail. And this is somewhat pertinent uh, that we are very cognizant of that. So what I'm gonna do is I just wanna mark this off for a second. I'm gonna get the little square here. And I wanted to show something. So we all know that the blue is smart and the red is dumb or institutional, right? And then this is a, a three-year chart. And you're gonna notice something. Whenever that the dumb money is up here and then it breaks down, you're gonna note this. So I'm always looking for this stuff and I'm always trying to figure out how to get like an edge out of it. And I note that when we cross here, meaning to the downside, right? Once we cross to the downside, I, you start to see institutions start picking up. And I think that's important to note that when you cross at these spots, institutions start buying. But if institutions are not in a hurry, what they will do is they will let retail bleed themselves out and then they'll take in more. If institutions move fast, retail moves fast. Your response to my statement might be, who cares? But the reason that you care is because that velocity of movement is probably a direct correlation, listen to the word probably, I'm still playing with it, a direct correlation to the velocity of this moving down and then the velocity of how fast this might come back up. right? And that's all gonna be earnings based. Remember, you, you need earnings right now. So we have this cross already. Now, if you go back a couple days, you didn't even break yet. I mean, you're already at the point of this break where you've already flushed. And now that you have that kind of break in here, where it's that the velocity, and when we start to go through this, you'll see what I mean by it. So once this crosses, that's the mark. And we see it over and over again, right? Now, once that happens, it just, it just exacerbates. But once this comes back, they panic. Institutions panic. I'll show you what I mean by this. Now, I, you need 30, 30 data points for something to be statistically significant. And I have not spent that amount of time on this yet, but I did find this really interesting. And this is what I do with my free time. So if you take a look at smart money, dumb money, right? Or institutions, retail, we get it now, okay. Note what happens here, note the change. In other words, we're basically going sideways to down, right? And then note the change right here on how all of a sudden it lifts. And once that change happens where retail says, no, 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 we're buying. Look what institutions do. Institutions get out of the way and sell, and that's not the smart move, right? But they only want to buy when it's easy to buy from retail. That's the only time they're buying. So if we take a look at this, and again, this is why it's so, it's so important to quantify smart money, dumb money, and what this stuff is, because then you might actually be able to use this data for something else. And what I'm using the data for right now is I'm trying to determine the velocity of this move. Like how fast is this gonna drop and how far is it gonna drop? And, and the only reason that things drop is because people sell them, right? If, if, if everybody got together and said, hey, don't sell, <laughs> then they're not gonna drop, right? Like we, we understand that, right? I mean, there's, it's, it's a confidence game. So if you take a look right here, what happened? All right, as soon as they knew that retail was going to keep selling, institutions just start buying. But institution, the gradient of institutional buying versus the, how fast this drops, it's nowhere near, right? So retail gets out faster, institutions take their time, and they just pick it off. And then what do they do? When they start competing with retail, what are they doing? And this is from 23 to 24. What do they do when they start competing with retail? They get out of the way and they sell to retail. And retail lifts it up. And they start selling to retail the whole way up, right? And I think that this is really important because now you look at where we are on the year, we're looking at this cross, and now you're saying, well, that's great, what's gonna happen? Well, what we need to do now is we need to watch and see what happens here. When does retail step back in? Or does retail keep selling faster? Does retail do this and keep selling? Or does retail do this? And the other important thing too, from my perspective, forget the up cross, we're looking at down crosses, is after you have the cross, for how much longer is the, is the average selling, right? That's something else that we're gonna work on. But here, watch, if we dig into this a little bit more here, so this is the three year, and I'm gonna leave this unedited so I can get it out faster. So again, smart money, dumb money, but th this is in spread, smart divided by dumb, right? Could get it, got it, good. All right, remember we talked about this and how we were in this range right along here for a period of time, and for, since the beginning of the year, you never popped over? Look at the velocity of that move. Like, that's not just like an angle, <laughs> that's literally straight up. And you've exploded from completely you know, negative to where you're at the zero line to where you're heading to here. At this pace, 
you're going to be here very, very quickly. If you look at where you were here to where you crossed the line, like previously, these happen super fast. I mean, you're, you're six to eight weeks usually for something like this to happen is what it seems to me. So if we're looking at this, then that is something that we have to be paying attention to as well. Now, I'd like to say this so people know it. You don't have $1.7 trillion in the market anymore, meaning when you were trading in 2020 and you start, thought you were super smart, you weren't right? It was the fact that the Fed was injecting everything, including the kitchen sink into the stock market. And so it just made everybody feel really smart. But if you take a look right here at that break, and this is year to date, this is it. And so you get into that, go April, and then you go, okay, well, what's going to happen next week? Well, next week, we start with all the corporate buybacks and everything. So the question is, how far are we going to drop before the corporate buybacks? How much selling is retail going to do? right into all of this into earnings and the answer is i don't know yet but i think it's going to be derived upon a couple key factors i certainly think it's going to be derived on earnings right i really do so that's where we're going with this and that's what i want you to focus on if they're going to do it on earnings then the earnings model is really important to us and we talked about this the other day with the spy I'm going to take all my levels off for a moment. So the one thing that I talked about with the SPY was the relative performance of the SPY versus the 10-year. Now, an easy way for you to look at this sometimes is take the SPY. I'm not going to divide it by TNX. I'll divide it by the 20-year, all right? And what you're going to do is you're going to get a chart that's going to clearly show that the SPY is doing what? Well, the SPY is taking out TLT. And for the longest time when the market was going higher, okay, it wasn't that way. But now they're buying the S&P versus buying TLT. So if we take this and we throw this into a chart, right? And then what we'll do is just draw this out for a second so you can see where I'm going with this. And you can go, well, it's always been this way. Well, yes and no. Okay, so then when you drill this into a little bit longer, you're going to see periods like in 23 where bonds outperformed, right? And when you get into one of these spots where bonds outperformed, what you're saying is you're basically saying that the yield of, of the bond is better than the yield of the market or else you wouldn't be buying the, in this case, I'm just using the 20 year, but you wouldn't be doing that, right? And I think that's a very important distinction. And this also falls in the same category of when I'll take the Qs and I'll divide it by the SPY for relative performance. And what I'm trying to get people to understand is that this is relative, it's not absolute. So all I'm saying is one is better than the other. So when we drill into this, like on an hourly, and you look at something like this, right, and you see, okay, well, we're not really going anywhere. Well, that's just relative performance. That doesn't mean that they're both not dropping. It just means that the S&P could drop more than, than the Qs. But what's going to drive us here is this, and this is this is where I'm going with this. So I, this is what I want you to understand, but I want you to understand why it's important. It's why I spent so much time on it yesterday, and I got a bunch of really good questions. So I'm going to, I want you to understand it a little bit more because I got some really good questions on it. All right, so you're at 465 right now, right? And then you have the S&P. So if we understand where this is, and we just, this is yield, and then we put the S&P in here. Now, the one thing about the S&P is, and if you just look at the date, I mean, it's pretty obvious what happened there, right? You went over 450 and wham. But what's important about this is why. And we went through the risk-free rate yesterday and earnings yield, and I want to make a couple comments on this. Now, sometimes I'll get some comments where people say, this is over my head. And I understand that not everybody's up to speed on a lot of this stuff. So one of the things was, can you go over earnings yield again? So I just want everybody to just, you can just screenshot this, right? And here's the whole way of how earning yield is calculated. But earnings yield helps investors understand how much they will be earning for each dollar invested in the company. And therefore, it's calculated as earnings per share divided by the stock price per share. Now, what you do is you take the entire S&P and you do this calculation, right? So you would take earnings per share and then you would take the stock price per share and then you just do the calculation. This ratio helps investors to make the comparison between two or more companies or assets or between two investments in shares versus the investment in risk-free securities. Okay, so then the next question is, what is a risk-free rate? A risk-free rate is the minimum rate of return inspected on an investment with zero risk by the investor. Okay, this, it is the hypothetical risk of return in practice. It does not exist because every investment has a certain amount of risk. If you buy a treasury, you have risk. You're expecting that the people will pay you, that the treasury will pay. That's why they're rated the way they are. That's why it's so important for that yield to be you know, as low as possible, right? 
But this is really important because what's happening, once you understand that, this will start making more sense as to why do you care about where the 10 year is, right? So like if you had to ask a question every time you wanna know why you should care about the 10 year, ask yourself where the earnings yield is on the S&P 500. And if you go out there and go, oh, well, the, er the earnings yield on the S&P 500 is roughly 4% right now. And then you go out there and go, okay, well, if the earnings yield is 4% right now and the 10 year is at 466, well, this is where it gets interesting because you would say, well, retail is not going to care about that because they're just going to YOLO into some GME options, right? It's not them that's moving the market, right? We just went through the whole smart money, dumb money thing. Pension funds have assumptions. So if a pension fund has an assumption, right? And then on the year, they're like, oh, we need to earn 8% because if we don't earn 8%, then the firefighters pension of New York or wherever it's from, they're not going to be able to make their payments to their people. So they have to go on assumptions. So anytime that they can lock in that assumption, right, even if it means less profit, they don't care. They're more concerned about getting to that level. So if they can get to this level with less risk, that's what they're going to do. They don't care if they could possibly get 12%. That's not their goal. Would they like that? Sure. But their goal is to meet those assumptions with as little risk as possible. That's very different than what we do as traders, right? What we do as traders and go, how can I make the most amount of money with the least amount of risk? What they do is say, my assumption's 8%. They stop it and say, you know, like we, we want to make 30% with the least amount of risk, or we want to see how high we can get with the least amount of risk, right? We're looking at it from an apps, you know, a, a not really so much absolute as relative to what we're doing, where they have an absolute number that they want to hit. And they set their assumptions once every year, three years, five years, depends on the pension fund. That's why it's so important to understand this, not because it affects you, you could care less, right? You're going to go out there and trade like I am, we're going to whack around the video for $10. Where am I going with this? Well, that's why names like Apple will issue dividends because then these people can worry about their assumptions. Those dividend yields affect the S&P. It also affects the earnings, right? So the whole thing's connected. Please understand that. That's why what we went over yesterday is so important. Now, where, this, where the next connection is, is how long inflation stays here. I'm gonna tie the whole thing together now. It'll take me two seconds. So one of the things I kept showing was Empire that came out. Empire came out yesterday and it was better than expected, the manufacturing numbers. And then we've been talking about global manufacturing and CPI and why it all matters. It all matters because global minus the US is back over 50. And we've talked about these levels of 50 before. Let me get my fancy pointer. We've talked about these levels of 50 before. And if you're over, this level, okay, you are what? Expanding. If you're below this level, you're contracting. The difference is when you break 45, you're basically in a recession. Over 55, you're red hot. You see where you were here and here and here? It's just not sustainable, right? And you can see what happens from there. All right, so you, you get it. That connection, if this gets hot, that that means the 10-year goes up. If the 10-year goes up and earnings do not keep up with how the 10-year is going, then the S&P will drop. If earnings do not keep up and increase the earnings yield, right, and the tenure keeps going up, they're going to be more interested in bonds than they are in equities, and hence you will get pressure on the market. The biggest thing besides that that you need to pay attention to, or the only thing you really need to pay attention to, is one o'clock tonight, ASML will come out with earnings. Uh, the move is predicted to be about 60 points. You're gonna to wanna to watch this and pay very close attention to it. That's it.